Welcome to First in the Family, where we explore the world of breaking generational patterns and chains due to access, education, will, or sheer bravery. We celebrate the ways that these accomplishments bring about joy. We honor the ways that these changes can lead to discomfort and pain, and we grieve the sacrifices that all of it requires. My name is Ceci, and I am your host. Thank you for joining us. Let's see who's first. I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, Shauna Llewellyn. Shauna is a licensed social worker. She is the principal consultant and owner of ARC and Moonlight, which offers executive coaching, organizational wellness assessments, strategic planning, and diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging coaching. She's also a consultant and project lead for Mary Pender Green Consulting. And she is a restorative justice uh, practitioner and uh, a healer. Please help me welcome Shauna Llewellyn. I want to just quickly rattle off for our, for our listeners all of the firsts that you indicated. And I always say, like, these are just the first because there's so many more firsts that by doing one first, it leads to like 10,000 others. Mm-hmm. So these are like the tip of the iceberg first, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but just so that we can go over them quickly, you are the first in your family to graduate from college, uh, to attain multiple degrees, to move out of your hometown, to pursue a career considered strange or non-traditional, to shift socioeconomic status, to parent differently, to travel outside the country, to not speak your family's native language, to start your own business, to challenge bigoted ideas or jokes or other xenophobic blind spots, to never think have to think about food insecurity and to never having to think about housing security, especially now as a mom. Woo-wee. Yeah. So first of all, <laughs> wow girl amazing what a what an achievement just to have that list of first do you, do you ever like sit back and go damn i do I, I do sometimes i do um i was um a while ago a couple years back i was talking to my biological mom about growing up um and she would say like there were days that like she didn't know what she was going to feed me um and I'm so grateful that I haven't had those days with Hunter Mm -hmm. but I also am acutely aware of like what it means for me to constantly like put any extra money that I have towards helping people who don't know how they're going to, you know, take care of their kids or who need diapers or who need, you know, like anything that I could do, like I really try to help support people. So sometimes I think about it and I think about like, wow, like, you know, Hunch is in a really good place, I think, for where he is in his life right now. He's five. But when I think, when I look back on all the firsts, I also think about how like they didn't come on, like, I didn't walk through those first unscarred. Like I have Mm -hmm. war marks on my, sometimes little physical war marks on my body from having to like traverse like these, these different things. And so being the first has been great in many instances because then I can help others. And that's kind of what I think about. Um, But also have not, has not been great sometimes being the first um Mm. can you tell us a little bit about about that like what what has what are some of the challenges I mean I'm sure we could talk for four hours about (laughs) those challenges but what are the ones that kind of have stood out as um maybe the the most difficult or the ones that come to mind when you think reflect on those years yeah I would say the biggest and most consistent thread of challenges would be um, the loss of people along the way. Like, Mm. it's true what they say, like, not everybody can come with you on your journey, wherever you're going. 
And some people will stay and some people will tend to veer in a different direction and that's fine. Mm -hmm. And I think there have been like these really amazing firsts where like I have, you know, the people who I love and care about to celebrate just weren't there for whatever reason. And I've had to experience them by myself. So like college graduation, for example, um, at the time, like I had mentioned, like there were all of these things going on in, at, in my life, which I ended up in, I ended up in foster care. So I ended up getting a fo- first, I went to a group home, the group home lost funding. I ended up going to um, a family that I knew because they allowed us to identify people that we would want to go with rather than being paired with someone random because at 17, it's very hard to get care. Um mm-hmm. So I ended up going with a friend's mom who I've known for a really long time and she became my foster mom. And in fact, often when I say, oh yeah, I'm going to my mom's house, that's exactly who I'm talking about. I'm talking about her. Um, But she, when I first came into her care, she was very cautious about interacting with my biological mom, who's a bit explosive um, in, in ways that are not predictable. And mm-hmm. so she was just like, you know what? If your mom's going to go to your graduation, I'm not going to go. But when you come home, you know, we'll have a good time. I want her to, you know, trying to be respectful of the space, not necessarily being like, I don't want to be around you because she really did want to go. Mm-hmm. So my mom, my biological mom, then like on the day of graduation calls me and she's like, oh, I can't go because I don't feel well, which is often the way she would respond to my own life events that would either usurp or challenge or go beyond what she wanted or had achieved for herself. Mm -hmm. And so she would often respond in this very flaky way. And she did, she followed suit, right? And so I try to explain to my foster mom at the time, like, no, it's totally fine. I don't think she's going to come. It's going to be right. She's like, no, I don't want any trouble, you know. Mm -hmm. She didn't come. Then my mom flaked on me the day of graduation. And it it was a huge first. You know, I had graduated... Um, And I had done really well in my major, which was English literature at the time. And there was no one there to like Mm. celebrate it. So I just, on the day of graduation, ended up packing my stuff and coming back home to New York. So being the first was great, right? But it was also challenging. It was also isolating, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I came home, you know, it was all like, hey, like, you know, but my foster mom was like really upset, you know, because she is the kind of person who's like, no, I don't want you to do that alone. And she was really upset that she had not like listened and like yeah. actually showed up to the graduation. So when I graduated from social work school, she kind of had this attitude that was like, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to show up <laughs> to <the> graduation. Yeah. <laughs> come hell or come high water. And I'm glad that she did. Um, yeah. But you know, it's like moments like that, that really mm. are like, oh, wow, that's bittersweet. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what I'm also present to in that story is like breaking generational trauma and so so many years and years and layers of pain being the first to do that doesn't break everybody else's. Mm-hmm. Right. So your biological mom clearly, you know, had her own things going on and issues and pain and whatever it is, right? Like they led to these explosive episodes and that that ain't that ain't got nothing to do with you. And right. yet you're still going to be impacted because you are the first, right? And like, and maybe your great, great grandbabies might listen to that story and be like, what? How <laughs> could that ever possibly occur? Um, but this is, this is why, right? Because great, great grandma Shana had to had to make that painful sacrifice and be there on her graduation day alone. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, I think about like, so, so now Hunter's in a different position. So he, and he's in a position where I think the difference is, is like, I just wanted her to be there no matter what. And it was a yearning Mm -hmm. the entirety of like my life right whereas with hunter it's different i can now go to hunter and be like do you want me to come to this thing or no and he'll be like no mom i'm good i got it or he'll be like yes no you should come because all the other parents are coming and he knows 
I will show up, you know? So, Mm -hmm. um, but I let him decide or determine. And then if we find out which happened a couple of times, once or twice this year, maybe about two or three times where like, I couldn't come to something and I, I broke my ankle. So it was hard for me to go to things at his school where he would be like, um, you weren't there, but I know it's because your ankle's broken. No. <laughs> and like, you know, I'd be like, yeah, I'm really sorry. But the other moms, you know, would sort of pitch in and be like, oh yeah, no, it's not a problem. Like I'll look out for him or he can run the mm-hmm. relay for our family or whatever. So, you know, I know that he felt cared for in that way, but still like the impact is there. Like if I'm not mm-hmm. there, so I think the difference between the way I was raised and the way I work with Hunter in that respect is like, my mom, when she sort of canceled on the day, she just, I didn't hear from her for months. You know? mm. <laughs> Where like, if there's something that I really can't make at Hunter's school, I'll try to do something with him after school. And then we'll talk about how he felt and like what I can do differently. And, you know, we have these check-ins monthly, maybe bi-weekly sometimes, depending on his mood and his moods fluctuate quite a bit. Like, we'll just have these check-ins of like, how can I be a better mom to you? Like, mm, love um, that. What, what are the things that you need? Um, you know, and he'll tell me. And then I think only on our recent, most recent check-ins, he's, I'll, you know, he'll say to me like, well, this is the thing I didn't like. And I'll be like, okay, I will try to do better. And then he'll sit and then he'll be like, you know what? I can also do better with listening. Like without oh. being prompted or anything yeah. like that. So, you know, I just, those are the things that I wish I had, but I don't, I don't try to project too much of what I wish I had on Hunter, but I do try Mm -hmm. to give him the choice to like, let me know what he needs, which I don't think I really have very much of growing up. Mm -hmm. Does that ever occur to you as like extra pressure or like, I'm curious, like, if that has shown up for you and if it has, like, how do you kind of keep that at bay so that it it does produce what sounds like this beautiful relationship with your child? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. There have been times I'll say like when I was first moving to Delaware, when, you know, I was getting everything together, I'm leaving Queens. I'm like, Oh my God, this is a big thing. I had spent like eight months preparing Hunter beforehand. Like, we're moving to Delaware. It's going to be great. I would bring him down when I was looking up, looking for places to live. But still, no matter how much preparation I thought that I had put in, I maybe like the week or two before, I I had like this emotional breakdown that like I was somehow fucking up my kid because I was making the choice to leave a relationship that wasn't serving me. And it wasn't serving our family in the way that it was supposed to. And I wanted Hunter to have a slower life, like a mm-hmm. like go outside and play, walk 10 feet in front of me. And I don't have to be like, Hunter, come back. Here. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can run in the meadow with the other kids and I don't have to, you know, I don't have to really worry. So, and I still was like, oh my God, I'm like picking him up. I'm taking him away from his dad, which wasn't actually the case, but like, you know, I had all of my own feelings. And so I just, I didn't become as obsessed with like making sure his trauma was like, was like that I wasn't traumatizing him. I don't think I was that obsessed. I was more obsessed with losing him as a kid. Like Mm. I was more obsessed with the, the, like just the unfair pressure on black mothers to be perfection otherwise Mm. someone is going to call acs on your kid and i was more obsessed with that Mm. than the expression of his trauma because i knew that i could sit down with him i could work with him i had seen some of his expression of his frustrations through the lockdown of like him me being his teacher his daycare administrator his right you know, everything for like a year, you know, because I took him out of, of preschool. So I had gotten to work with him in that way, but it was more around like just trying to move through my shit, help him move through his shit 
and like not being perceived as a parent who's like mm. worthy of having their kid taken away for anything. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I hear that. Mm-hmm. And that that was that is in that <laughs> will drive anyone mad because yeah. you cannot control what other people are thinking or doing or saying. Someone may very well pick up the phone and try to call ACS over some bullshit. I've seen it happen a bunch of times. Like I've walked families through bullshit calls, you know, and I've walked families through really serious neglectful calls. So I understand the difference, you know, but yeah. it's 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 a different ballgame when you're a parent and you're under the same or similar systems of oppression and you're trying to like help your kid navigate the world and mm. help navigate his feelings and you know, still battling these these things. Yeah, yeah. No, that's real. And that's definitely something I've, I won't say never, but very rarely has been top of mind for me. Um, one, I'm not a Black woman. Two, I'm also, that wasn't a part of my story. So it feels foreign, mm-hmm. right? But I'm constantly obsessed of like, oh my gosh, what if something happens to me and my babies are, lo-? you know, because that's what happened, right? And so it's in your um, pre-survey, you mentioned this quote, which I had actually not heard before. So I'd love for you to say more about this, um, that mothers are humans who sometimes give birth to their pain instead of children. Mm-hmm. And as you were talking, like I was reminded of, of that. Can you share why this quote has sort of stayed with you and what that means to you? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I can give you a little bit of the backstory of this quote. So <clears throat> I had worked at this transfer high school in New York and for overage undercredited young people. And one of the te- one of the English teachers there who had been there for like 10 years, maybe a little longer, kept teaching the same book over and over again every year to the point where mm-hmm. some kids would end up taking her class again for a different reason and I'd be like I already read this book mm. when I talked to her like well why are you still teaching them this book her response to me was like well they can't really read big books like what? I don't want to set them up for failure so I just read this particular book with them which was Bodega Dreams so I said all right no it's not, it's not wrong with Bodega Dreams it's fine it's a fine text but it was like not relatable to the young people. And I, you know, sort of did my my <laughs> my thing of like, well, maybe we can add more stuff that might be, um, you know, diverse. And she was just like, well, this is what they can get through and that's it. So I was like, all right, hold my beer. And I started <laughs> a book club with some of the students. And the first book we read was The Coldest Winter. And mm-hmm. when I tell you, those young people read, the, read that book in like two days. Like I had to slow them down and be like, Yo, we got to actually talk about the book and like, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and people who who were catching up had time to catch up. But we met every week. We had pizza. Mm-hmm. We talked about the book. And it was really because people either knew a winter in their neighborhood. Maybe they were when some of them were winter. Some mm-hmm. of them, their sisters or cousins or aunties were winters. And so it was very relatable. And so they were able to pick up all of the devices that Sister Soldier was using in the book to tell, to like weave narrative and storytelling in ways that this teacher didn't believe. Mm. So the next book that we read in the book club was Salt, which is where this, this quote comes from by Naira Wai. And we, we spent our time like just moving through the poems. And I think for them, they were under the guise that like poems had to be these long, prolific things. And they had not read something that was like in small chunks and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and powerful, like they were small chunks, but like packing a punch. So, um, we read, one about flowers and men and that stuff with them. But for some reason, we spent the most discussion on this particular poem. Mm. And it was really because so many people were able to relate in the in the group, were able to relate to like what was being discussed about moms, mm. like what they felt. Some of the young people um, who I was working with were pregnant themselves. So like, 
we had a conversation about like, well, what does it mean? Like if we have our kids, like do, what are the things we want to shape and shift and change? And so I love to use like text like that to help people draw out what their own, what they want their narrative to be, hmm. which research has supported that if you get people to write the future of their narrative, it is more likely that they will look to it and accomplish it rather than drawing it up by brain and like right. and dissipate when they return to the environment of, of their community. So we spent a lot of time talking about what it means to mother, how they've been mothered, who are people who mm. weren't their biological mothers who mothered them, who in the building, mm. you know, felt like mothers and aunties to them. And so um, it was relatable for me because I often felt like I was a, like I was a piece of my mother's pain. Like I, I didn't feel like it would like my birth was a joyous thing, although she describes joy. Um, but the way that I lived out my life with her, with me being in her care did, was not, was anything but joyous. Yeah. So if our mothers are not cognizant of how much pain they're holding, then they will inevitably give birth to it mm. along with their children. And that's indicative of how we pass, pass on trauma, um, generational trauma without disruption. So, you know, that, that quote has been very important in sort of keeping me anchored and like, not necessarily like, Oh, I got to pack your lunch every day because if you don't have a lunch, I'm a failed parent, right? Like, or mm-hmm. even not that it's, it's just keeps me grounded and focused enough to help me realize my own stuff and like the ways in which that I might be putting that on Hunter or not mm. um, so that I'm not, so that he doesn't feel like he is my pain instead of my joy. Yes. Oof, girl, I wrote down a bunch of stuff as you were talking. <laughs> no, it's it's um it's powerful because I think this is something that regardless of your story, how you grew up, whether you grew up with or without parents, in the suburbs, poor, whatever it was, mm-hmm. this can still resonate, right? Mm-hmm. Like whatever pain you're not cognizant of or not addressing or not naming is gonna show up. Mm-hmm. And we all got pain and trauma, whether it's capital T or lowercase T, it's it's going to be there. And so I um, I appreciate you naming the importance of that. And um, and shout out for like giving those young people like these precious tools as as they embark on parenthood. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I just. <laughs> I don't know, a fire gets like a fire of a fiery anger gets stoked inside of me when I hear white people, particularly white teachers, be like black and brown young people cannot Mm -hmm. X, Y, Z. And I'm not saying that they're number one at the top of their class of readers, but don't not meet them where they are and then not give them a chance to explore. Because when I bought those sister soldier books, they read them. They read the what? They're like, that's like a 300 page book. And they read it just fine, right? right? To the point where I had to buy part two and part three. And I was like, all right, all right, all right. Everybody's got to get a library card now. We're going to go to library. <laughs> <laughs> like, but, you know, because my school had funds and I bought, you know, the different books, but we were able to explore. We read The Hate You Give. We read Salt. Mm-hmm. We read um, part two. Then we read the part three. Like we, we just did the, we just met them where they were and they were able to yeah. read it just fine. So I don't know. I felt like I was just so angry. <laughs> so mad. Yeah. I knew like just by having conversations with young people every day, like saying good morning to them every day. Like, are you f- not, not like, how, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Was my question with them every morning. Like, mm. you know, and if they weren't feel, how was your train ride? Like, you know, mm. Then you get to learn things, but I don't know. Something about that conversation just set me on fire. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And I mean, thank God that you were there, right? Because this teacher had been doing that for, you said, like something like 10 years, right? (laughs) Just like I'm going to teach the same book over and over for like 10 years. 
And it wasn't like she didn't have a plethora of other books in her room. She did. She mm-hmm. often had crates of other books in her room, but she just stuck with the same. Right. Right. And it, you know, uh, I, I feel like I've been in different circumstances, whether in the school systems as a student or as an educator myself. And um, I also get frustrated because I'm sure that teacher had like a handful of experiences where she was affirmed, right? Like she was like, see, look, they didn't get the point of this story or didn't read that word correctly or whatever it was. And so began this cycle where she was actually stifling like generations of people. And I think what's what's so important about this that I, that stands out to me is like those kids were probably the first in their families to do a bunch of stuff too. And mm-hmm. because it didn't look the way that teacher might have been accustomed to, right? Um, and and she didn't maybe have the tools to translate in sort of way that would actually resonate, she wasn't affording them the full scope of opportunity mm-hmm. because of it because of it. And I, and I feel like, you know, I, I've been very lucky. I don't even, I don't know that it's anything else except luck to like be taught in, in schools and be taught how to use the right words and do the right things. Um, and basically use the, the white normative culture and language, right. And speak without an accent so that I am perceived in a certain way. Right. Like I, I often talk about, I trained myself to lose my accent in high school, but, and, and yet, and still I have received that same sort of assumptions and bias and told that I couldn't do certain things. Um, So it, it, all that to say is kudos to you and fuck that teacher. (laughs) (laughs) And if you're a teacher doing that, please cut that shit out. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, the, the thing is, it's like you're right about saying like they, you know, how transformative that experience was for them because students, other students in the building saw them reading this book and saw them talking to each other mm-hmm. about this book where they would talk to their friend like, oh, Shauna gave me this book because we were on first name basis at that school. And um, they'd be like, yo, Shauna gave me this book and, you know, da, da, da. and so then students who weren't in the club would come to my office and be like, I don't really want to join the book club because, you know, there's such and such person I don't like there, but I want to read this book because everybody Mm -hmm. keeps talking about it. So I would have to, even though I had 12 copies for the book club, I ended up ordering 50 because so many people were talking about it. And I said, okay, well, if you're not going to talk about it in the book club, you you can come to me one-on-one and we'll talk about it. And that's Mm -hmm. what we did. And, you know, so I was, there were times where I was using the book um, it clinically to like help people like process mm-hmm. the things that they were experiencing in their neighborhoods that they felt were holding them back or yes. you know, traumas and stuff like that, which was um really great. But then there were just other young people who were just like, well, I just want to read it because it seems interesting. And they just kept coming like That's that. Right. Um, and eventually I just let people keep the book because they were like, my cousin needs to read this book. <laughs> you know, and I, was like, I love that. So I love that. That's the butterfly effect though, right? Like when you create opportunity and, and allow people to show up fully and not just, again, that those, these boxes, I feel like that's the theme of today is going beyond the box and just integrating every side of them. Like, how can you connect with them knowing what you know about their life, about where they're from? Maybe that book ain't it, right? It might've been it. For you know Joey seven years ago, right? But maybe it's not it anymore, right? right? Like that's that's powerful stuff. That's shifting paradigms in a really meaningful way. Thank you. And this is before, like you know, schools were like, "What's our diversity list of books that we're gonna?" Yeah, read. I'm like, you can just ask young people what they like, and then Word. you, as the literature expert can make the connections to the types of books that they might like and let them choose. Right. So we were sitting in like restorative circle spaces when we would talk about these books, which I think some people are under the impression like restorative spaces have to be about like healing harms. And it's like, no, you can actually have academic texts that are powerful to people's lives and have a conversation around it in a restorative circle or in a restorative space. 
And that's what we would do. And you could see the effects, you know, and but I think it was, I chose that book because when I was in high school, someone gave me that book and it shifted the way that I thought about my life, the way that I thought that I needed to be and the way that I needed to show up in my neighborhood. And like, I'm like, all right, well, (laughs) we're going to keep passing the tradition along. (laughs) I love that. Paying it forward. See, Mm -hmm. I wish somebody would have handed me a book. I never, ever got into books because, well, first of all, I think my brain is just not set up to like sit with a book for a long time, which is fine. But the times that I did have to read, Lord, it was painful. I could not connect with any of these stories that I was, I remember we read a book where the red fern grows and I remember being like what the hell is happening in this book they had mm-hmm. dogs that would hunt I didn't know dogs hunting dogs existed mm-hmm. so I thought it was like a magical book I was like I don't like magical books why are these <laughs> dogs hunting like what this doesn't make mm-hmm. any sense they would talk about fern I had no idea what a fern was okay mm-hmm. we had no ferns in the city we had no plants okay. in this house and I just hated these moments where it would take so much for my brain to sit down and like focus and actually be able to and then when I finally would do the reading I don't know what the hell was going on so all I used to read was poetry mm-hmm. no you're absolutely right and there are lots of texts like that but I think what what I was able to do was help them translate the text, right? So I would be like, like some, let's say something happened in the book and I'd be like, you know, this is very similar to what happened in Macbeth. Have you guys read Macbeth? Like, because I knew that they were still required to read these old white dead men texts, but still needed a way to translate that, right? And so it was just, I think, some educators are really great at doing that. And some educators really miss the mark by not using like inclusive text to help people draw out the things that they need to learn in other quote unquote standardized texts that they'll have to learn to either get through high school or get through college or whatever. And they just sort of stop short. You know? That's so true. Mm-hmm. I don't, I didn't resonate with a book until we were, I was in the sixth grade. Mm. And and that was the first time when we met, uh, read, um, what is it called? Um, the Attic, the, the story of... Um, I was in the Attic? Hmm? I was no, in the Attic. it's the uh, Anne Frank story. I think it's called oh. The Attic or something like that. Um, apologies uh, to the literary buffs out there who are probably like, duh. But... It was the first time I had read anything about the Holocaust because we did a whole Holocaust unit. And um, and it was about Anne Frank and her family and hiding out in the island. It was just, so, I read that thing in probably like a week, which for me might as well be a day because I, again, I wasn't a reader. And it was the first time that I was captivated by a book. I was like, what? Because, you know, the pain and the anguish and, you know, I hadn't been through what she had been through, but I I resonated with like, fear and pain and trauma and I was like where have these books been what have y'all been giving me like this is what I need to be reading but I think at that point I had already resigned to like I'm not a reader so (laughs) (laughs) I, I, I love that book and then eventually over the years I started picking up books here and there but I I literally never became a reader for that reason I just could not find myself in a book at all yeah um didn't either for a long time but I read I was a voracious reader so my appetite for reading outweighed whatever was available to me yeah ironically that's how I became so into astrology because Mm. my, my like we used to have the scholastic book club like this very thin piece of paper, you would check off the books that you want. You send in the money with the teacher and then like six weeks to forever, the books would come (laughs) and you would get the books. And I was a big Beverly Cleary fan. I read all of the Mm -hmm. Ramona books um, because at the time that was just available. And I read it by accident and I was like, oh, she's very 
now I'm an adult precocious and she's kind of like mischievous yeah. me. like I'm gonna read yeah. it but when my mom stopped being able to afford to do the scholastic book club I was like left with no books because I had read everything already mm. so she gave me the she gave me the books that she thought that I needed to read so she gave me the autobiography of Malcolm X yes oh and I was like okay like and I was fascinated like but then she didn't have anything left to give me. So I just started reading what was in her library. And she had bought a number of astrology books. And oh. I was just reading those. Or I, I didn't was, know this. Mm-hmm. Like, she was a young mom. So she was kind of like, my biological mom was low-key selfish. So she would buy herself the astrology books. But she would <laughs> not give me the money for the scholastic reading. So I would just read whatever she bought. Like, I would just, you know, read the thing. Um, and then there were other things that I like read. I mean, I was the most fascinated with Malcolm X's story, but there were other things that I read in middle school that I was like the color purple, like, Mm -hmm. and it's because I was like really into diary based narratives. So like, you know, I read a lot of Judy Bloom's books are written in like those diary narratives. I had read those, but I was like, oh, let me read this. And, you know, just wanting to read things that felt like it was bringing me closer to the people, to my people, but that yeah. wasn't you know, always available. That was, that was difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'd love to shift gears a little bit and sure. um, talk about maybe a couple more of, of the challenges that you mentioned um, especially in your in your survey. And one thing that came up a lot that stood out to me that I, um, I wanted to hear more about, if you feel comfortable, is you mentioned your family a lot. Mm-hmm. And as you're navigating all of these firsts, right, college and multiple degrees and jobs and all of these things, um, you mentioned folks thinking that you thought that you were better than other people. Mm-hmm. You mentioned jealousy you mentioned not fitting in right like you said not hood enough for the hood and not culture enough for the the sadity side Mm -hmm. so this is something that i'd love to if you have uh, a few more minutes to spend some time on because i think this is this has come up a few times of like as you're navigating the first almost feeling displaced from previous lives Mm -hmm. um so can you talk a little bit about what that was like, how you've navigated and maybe, you know, where you are today with all of that? Yeah, at first I didn't, I didn't identify it as jealousy because I didn't think I had anything there was to be jealous of. Mm. It wasn't until like one of my aunts was like, yeah, you know, like your cousin is very jealous of you. And I was like, what? Like it just, didn't make sense to me. I think my own conceptualization of family, whether it's the family you're born into or the family you choose is like that, that's not, that shouldn't be part of it. Right. Um, and I think that there was, I was just telling the story the other day. I went to my cousin's house for Christmas one year. Um, and she was like, she had a friend over and the friend knew I have two cousins. Let's call them Tia and Tamara. My friend knew of Tia and Tamara, but she didn't know me. So it was her first time meeting me. So the friend is like, you sound different. (laughs) You don't sound like those two. Like, and I'm like, oh, okay. I don't know how to take that. So the oldest cousin in the room is like, oh yeah, because she's our college graduate. She's the smart one in the family. Mm. The other one is like, yeah, she's, she's, she's the one that 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 gets all of the she's all she's super book smart mm. right and you know You're like and, that sounds like a compliment but it doesn't sound like a compliment <laughs> right and I'm like I know that I was like this does not I was like all right I'm gonna just let it slide because you know you pick your battles and um and she was like yeah she said like, well what school did you go to and I was like well I went to SUNY Binghamton so she's like oh yeah like um that's a really good school. Like really smart people go there. And I was like, yeah, now the friend wasn't being, is this she was just genuinely surprised that she had met someone who went to Binghamton. I've gotten that 
a, a couple of times in New York, although I don't really get that out of New York because they're like bigger who <laughs> the, you know, and I was like, yeah, no, it's, it's, it was a great school. It was a fun time. <laughs> you know, right. I didn't have anything else to say. Right. Um, but later on after the friend left, cause she had just stopped by to say hi after the friend left, my eldest cousin is like, um, so where are you working? And I'm like, oh, I work at this place or whatever. And, you know, there's a lot of things happening. And and at the time I was working in PR, so in public relations. And so she was just like, oh, so you, you're going to go and like work for these white people, knowing that these white people don't even want you there. I don't think she was wrong in the assessment, but it didn't come from a good place. It wasn't mm. like, hey, what's your plan? Like what? Right, like, you know what right. I'm it wasn't good, that. sis. It's was just like, oh, you like you're gonna go, and it was the tone of like you think you're better than us, and I was like, well, I don't plan on working for them forever, but I need to work for them for a long enough amount of time to figure out how they're running their business, so that I can jump ship and run my own business. And then she got quiet, mm-hmm. um, you know, and she she didn't really like say anything else. She tried to point out some other situation. It was like a conversation of like how can I break this person down? So she tried to like Mm. find another situation Mm. that would like, it was clear that the goal was to break me down in the conversation. Like, and I just wouldn't, like, I, I didn't take the bait. I just, you know, I just stated things as matter of factly and I didn't take the bait and she, you know, eventually I left, but that's been kind of the vibe. Like, you know, oh, this person, as I've been living with polycystic ovarian syndrome, it's been very difficult for me to like lose weight to like very much more difficult than the average person because your body thinks it's starving all the time. You, it, it's totally like um, resistant to insulin. Like it's just all kinds of things going on. So, you know, I try to, as, as I've gained weight, now we have like, you think you're better than us and there's fat phobia attached to it and like Mm. you know as I've explored my gender and my sexual identity like then there's like those there's like queer phobia laying on top of it so now you're like traversing through family dinners like having to move through these kinds of conversations where you are made where someone is making an attempt to make you feel inadequate but the reality is is that I didn't, I recognized that I didn't have to tear into the bait, bite into mm-hmm. it, you know, take the bait. Doesn't mean it wasn't hurtful. It doesn't mean it wasn't impactful. It just meant that I had to f- pick and choose my battles about how to say things or how to not say things. On my dad's side, it's very, very sedity, very like well to do people there, you know, but also a lot of secrets are kept there. It's like, they mm. are tightly wound there. They don't really like this. Hell, is, there might be scandal, but they don't really talk about it. Like, you know, and so, you know, being on that side of the family, not having as many close connections on that side has also put me kind of like as an outsider, like mm-hmm. I might be college educated, but, you know, I'm not, I don't have a ton of wealth. I don't have, you know, all of these things. So, um, and I'm not, close enough to know all of the family secrets. So, you know, I'm still an outsider in that respect. So I'm not sedity hmm. enough. And, you know, for some of my eldest cousins, I'm not hood enough. <laughs> but one, you know, I don't, I pick and choose the times that I say something. So yeah. there have been times where I've had to be like, at least, you know, on, on my mom's side of the family where I've had to be like, just because I don't say everything, it doesn't mean I don't see everything. And it doesn't mm-hmm. mean I'm not noticing what's happening. I just choose not to say anything. Um, you know, like when little side digs are like taken at me, mm-hmm. there's an assumption that like, because I'm the book smart one, that I don't have street smarts, mm-hmm. which nothing could be further from the truth. Because right. I don't have get a it twisted. ton of street smarts, right. And in fact, it was it what has... And this is not going to sound great, but what has been both my own personal quiet sense of fun 
has been shocking people who didn't think that I was street smart, like by outsmarting them. So they just assume like, oh, she's book smart. She doesn't have these street smarts. And I just observe and I lean into the like, oh yeah, I'm book smart. I don't have street smarts. And then I like outmaneuver them into something or a bet or an idea or a conversation. And then I move along my way. Right. Yeah. And it's not, I'm not trying to, you know, hurt people or harm people, but it's like, uh, there are some spaces where I just choose, I choose how I hold my energy. Mm-hmm. And I sometimes don't choose to use that energy to disrupt their assumptions. I, sometimes I just let them, ha- let their assumptions just go. But it took me a very long time to do that. I mm-hmm. think the other thing that has helped me navigate is that the more in depth I became into my spiritual life, the more that my ancestors would reveal their lives and my dreams. And so I was able to see that they, I was able to witness the trauma that they had experienced. I was able to witness the struggles that they had gone through trying to put their own businesses together. Like I got to see a lot of stuff that I had asked at my own altar to like show me, right? Because dream dreamscaping or dreaming is like the, um, most open spiritual sort of space for me. Like mm. for some people it's meditation, for some people it's tarot cards, for me it's dreaming. Mm. Um, and so being able to see that helped me be like, oh, I'm not as alone as I think I am or have thought that I was. Um, and that if they navigated this, then I can navigate it too. So when you say you've seen the pain and trauma, are you talking about previous generations? Are you talking about folks that you know or? No, the, the, some, of, some of the ancestors are people that I don't have a, re- I don't know them in, in life. I don't know who they are. Mm-hmm. I know that they're related to me in some way because when I sit at my altar and I pray and I meditate and I talk about receiving like guidance, I'm not always talking about receiving guidance in waking life. Like, Mm -hmm. so when I go to sleep, I will be sort of doused in these kinds of very dreams. And the dreams are that I'm looking through the lens of the person. But like, if I was to walk to to a mirror in the dream, it wouldn't be me. Uh, I could see how they lived. I can see, like, you know, one of, um, one of the men in my dreams um, in my family, he's in my family. And this came about actually not the backtrack a little bit from doing my family tree on ancestry. Oh, nice. So I did like the DNA and then I started putting the pieces together of the family tree based on documents and da da da. And so I would just be like, I don't know who any of these people are. And, you know, sat at, sat at my altar and, you know, the, the folks who guide me and who love me and who I know, I just ask them to help me together the pieces of my family. And I would get these dreams every night, like of somebody's life somewhere, somehow. And there was this man in my dream who was a kid who was a runner. Now, my aunt had told me this story about her stepfather or uncle. I forget his relation, but essentially he was married mm-hmm. to my great, great grandmother, Ruth. Okay. Ruth was like what you would know, what you would call the village psychic. She's on 119th and Lennox reading people's tea leaves, tarot cards. Her apartment, right now in Harlem, the apartment's all cut up, but hers wasn't at Mm. that time. So she had like six bedrooms and, you know, multiple bathrooms. And one of the rooms my aunt was telling me no one was allowed to go into and was filled with statues and candles. And that's where she did all her readings and stuff like that. So she was married to this, to this, this mate, this big drug dealer in Harlem named Al, Al Jones. And at the time I just didn't know who that was. And I was like, I don't, you know, but he did so much for our family. Mm. I had a dream that he was smaller and he was a runner. Mm. And he was a runner for another big drug dealer, presumably in Harlem. They were at a bar and someone came in and shot up the bar. And he, Mm. the guy he was running numbers for, because, you know, illegal lottery or whatever, he was running numbers for, the guy pushed him behind the bar, 
threw a trap door underneath the bar and told him to stay there. And oh. everyone was like, whatever it was, everybody was down. <laughs> like oh. there was not a person. No one was living to tell the tale except for this little boy. He came out of the trap door of the bar and, you know, so, but I could see it through his eyes. So mm. it wasn't my life. It wasn't, you know, it was his life. And that's often the way that my ancestors would share dreams with me. Wow. Feel the feelings. I could feel the terror. I could feel the fear. I could feel all of those things. So what it helped me to realize was like, these are not unique of unique events, unique feelings, I should say, that I'm having around isolation and like what it means mm. differently and like what it means to to be left by a parent to your own devices and yeah. try to figure out your way. Like these kinds of traumas are generational and they're traumatic and they're being passed down. But, you know, it also helped me sort of make choices like, oh, I don't want to have to be put in a position where I have to sell drugs in order to like take care of myself yeah. because that's what great grandfather Al had to do. You know, like I didn't, right. it just helped me to really put things in perspective so that I could really be proud of being the first because of how much I've been able to bear witness to in my dreams Wow, that people have been through, you know? So like, I was able to have appreciation in that way wow. where I was really taught to have appreciation for my experiences. So I had to learn it through my ancestors and my dreams. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And what a gift to feel so connected to your roots mm -hmm. when so much of it was absent in your upbringing. So that's, wow, what a gift. And does that give you compassion for family members who might say that you think you're better or you don't fit in or you're not this enough or not that enough to, or, or does it feel different I don't know if it's compassion but it definitely it doesn't bother me as much as it used to mm. I didn't really have I also didn't really have good boundaries you know when yeah. I was a baby so everything bothered me and bothered me to the highest fucking pinnacle of being bothered. And mm -hmm. that was just too much energy <laughs> being wasted yeah. on being bothered. So it it's le like now, like people are who they still are, but I'm able to look at them like from a different mindset. It's not compassion. Maybe it's grace. Mm. Um, and it's like part of my restorative work is like, you know, one of the frameworks is like, you you just can't throw people away. And so like for however malicious or jealous that people are, I, I have to be able to live the values of what it means to be a restorative practitioner and facilitator mm -hmm. in my everyday life. When people challenge me, when people upset me, when people say fucked up shit, like I still got to be able to respond try to respond for my most restorative self I'm not perfect at it sometimes I just don't sometimes I still curse people out but then there's other times where I have to be like okay like what's a way that I can be restorative in this way hold grace for this person allow them to you know be who they are pick and choose my battles right because I can still name a thing if that needs to yeah. be named um, and I can do so in a way that's like straight and to the point, but I also got to be mindful of like, are you still giving them grace? You know what I'm yeah. saying? They are. Yeah. So that's just challenge is hard as hell. It's hard yeah. as hell. So. It's hard. And and I think it, it also can be very lonely because mm -hmm. um, I think what's really wise about what you're saying is that you're more conscious of how you're using your energy um, at one point, maybe even depleting your energy. So focus on what other people think, what other people say, how people are thinking about you, which I think I've done probably 10 million times in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but when you do liberate yourself from that idea, right, of like, you can't talk to me that way or I'll show them or I'm going to outsmart you or whatever the thing is, I I think there's there's peace that sort of comes and like you said, grace. Um, 
But I think it also can feel like, well, then where where is the the space right that that I belong in? And I think I realized early on that the old worlds we used to live in, like I wasn't gonna fit in to those old worlds, even though I, I kind of wanted to, right? Like, and the new worlds that I was stepping into, like I also wasn't gonna <laughs> fit in fully there. Um, I think I spent a long time grieving that, right? Like, damn, the the place that I came from in New York, that doesn't work anymore. The place that I've been going to, that doesn't work for me. So where the hell am I gonna go? Um but I love that you're naming that that the importance of not just having grace for other folks who might have their opinions and critiques, but also that grace for yourself mm-hmm. um, is so important. And and what has been sort of your like your refuge inside of all of that, like navigating this space or that space, and the sedity and the hood and the oh she bet like where where have you landed? after doing so many years of work and working through that? Mm. Well, the place that I landed very early on is that crying is super healthy. Um, mm. And yes. I cry and I will, and now I'm sort of hardwired to like cry it out first mm. and then be like, okay, I can get to work now. And it's, yeah. I, it, it's a clearing for me, you know, it's like clearing the thick of the weeds in a way for me, because when I'm crying, when I used to cry, I used to cry in a way that was like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Like, what's mm. wrong with me? Like, why can I not keep friendships? Why can I not keep a partner? Why can I not like keep my family? Why? Like, what the fuck is wrong with me? And I would cry in that way. And then the more that I started like working on myself, my crying shifted to what's happening with my feelings. Why is this coming up for me? Why, like, what is this attached to? Like, yeah. And sometimes I just cry without those questions. Sometimes I just cry to get it all out. When I get it all out, I just feel so much clearer. And then I can ask those questions like, wow, what was that about? Like, I just try to meet myself where I'm at and Mm. good, bad, or indifferent, you know, being able to practice that on myself is what allows, was what is allowing me to teach Hunter how to do the same. Because I think, not I think, but a lot of the times we are often tasked with asking people to do shit we wouldn't normally do ourselves or we Mm -hmm. can do ourselves. And I think that that's really unfair. So I just try to go through my own motion. So crying is super healthy. Like that's one place. I used to be a big journal writer. I'm not as much anymore, but I will create voice notes and Mm. talk through what I'm experiencing. Sometimes I look like I'm talking to myself, but I'm talking to my phone. And (laughs) (laughs) big difference, big difference. (laughs) And talking through on a voice note helps me to just verbally process, like, Mm. what are all of the things that I'm feeling and, you know, things like that. Um, So those would be like my two biggest Mm. that I use, like, get me through. You mentioned that you have a community of other firsts Mm -hmm. um, and folks who are the first to heal generational trauma. How have you built that community and and where do you find them? Where are they hiding? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, you know, the unfair, the unfair, but slightly true rumor about social work school is that people are going there to heal their own shit Mm -hmm. and not, go in there for the profession to help people walk through their own healing journeys. Um, and so sometimes you'll find people who are like, this is great to know about me, but I'm going to go to therapy because this is bringing up a lot of stuff for me. And so yeah. I think it's been like having a nice community of black and brown social workers who 
took the route of being like, I'm going to be in therapy while I'm in social work school so that I'm not projecting this shit on my clients, you know, who are keeping healthy therapeutic boundaries, keeping help, building healthy boundaries in their own lives, like just people who are working through their shit. Like, so social work school was one place that I found a community of people. And then as I've like done work or participated in different things, like different creative things, like writing and painting, you know, you find other people who are willing to do the work on themselves um, in a way that's like not toxic or harmful. Mm. Um, so finding finding community has also been a very long journey for me because every community that I've found that I have gravitated towards has like slipped out of my hands within a couple of years. So mm. it's been nice to have longstanding relationships and come to the come to terms with the fact that they don't have to be 50 people big. They can be five people big and yeah. be just enough. You know? Yeah. Mm, I love that. I love that. The importance of, of tribe. Mm-hmm. Right? Tribe can be two people. It, it really can. And and that's okay. Like there is nothing wrong with that. I mm-hmm. Don't mind a smaller tribe, although my tribe is a little, you know, it's a, it's a little bit bigger. Now I have like a community of moms, a community of like, you know, yeah. but all the people I know who are first in their family are still navigating, are navigating family trauma. I would say, you know, they're still having to meet problematic people where they are so they can get through their visits and get through their own sanity and manage their own energy. Like that feels like in the community of first that I know that is forever work. Mm. I don't know how to describe it. It's like not going to change. So that person passes away. And even then grief brings on a separate set of trauma. So yeah. like, it doesn't mean it goes away. You just figure out ways to navigate it better and more healthily. Mm, I love that. You mentioned Hunter a lot, obviously, um, your baby love. What do you, now that you've seen him in his own life, um, what are you like proud of and what does he have access to? And you too, but uh, now that you're experiencing life through his eyes, Mm -hmm. what are the results of all those those first, but also like all the sacrifices, right. That came with those first, Mm -hmm. what are you able to appreciate and see now through Hunter's eyes, through your eyes as his mom and, and every, everything that you all are doing together. What's, what are you proud of? What is like astonishing to you now? I am most proud of his ability to advocate for himself when I was growing up, I was often shut down. I don't, I don't think I realized. I mean, I don't, even though I knew how to maneuver through spaces, I didn't quite identify that as a level of intelligence. Like I knew street smarts was smarts. I knew that was smarts and I knew book smart, but I didn't realize that there were other types of intelligences that I was actually working with. Yeah. So I didn't realize I was like smart until I was 30, 31 wow. maybe. Um, mm-hmm. Because I spent, I had a childhood of just my parents really sort of like tearing me down. Like, you're not smart, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid. And believing I was stupid for a long time, it didn't matter if I went into honors, eighth grade math, didn't matter if I was in honors history, it just felt like I was life-wise stupid. Mm. Um, and so once I have figured out like, oh, wait a minute, I'm actually intelligent. Like I'm kind of smart. Yeah. Yeah. Then, you know, I sort of didn't, you know, miss a beat with all the things I was meant to accomplish. And I, the difference here with Hunter is I treat him as if he's intelligent, but I, I'm not like, oh, that's so smart. I'm also like, that was creative or yeah. that way a detective would have solved that problem or that, you know, I try to like 
instill in him like, no, you actually have skill and you have voice. So I give him choices. I give him options. And if there's something that he doesn't like, he'll come to me. He'll tell me that he doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's times where he'll say things to me and I'll be like, God damn it. Like, you know, um, but I can't shut him down because I'm teaching him the language of yeah. like what it means to do it in that way. Yeah. Um, and so then he'll come home from school and he'll tell me like, well, I didn't like how this kid was treating me. And I'll be like, oh, okay, well, what did you do? I told him to stop. And did he stop? No, he didn't stop. So what'd you do? I went and I told the teacher and I'm like, that's great. Like, so right, right. I, you know, in the moments where he's doing it with me and I'm like, God damn it. But I I have to let him. So I'm most proud of his ability to like advocate for himself. You know, he has a length, he's five and he's like, I don't feel comfortable with that. Or mm. that doesn't make me feel good. Um, or if he's crying, I'm like, Hunter, do, do, do your feelings hurt or does your body hurt? Like so that he can differentiate mm. like what, what's coming from where. And so the next time he cries, he's able to tell me like, my feelings hurt. I'm right. very frustrated with you. <laughs> and yeah. he said that, that's part of yeah. his language. And I don't shut him down. Like, you ain't got nothing to be frustrated about. You don't pay no bills in here. Right. <laughs> that, was like, you know, that was like the yeah. narrative. But like, I'm like, all right, well, what are you frustrated about? I'm frustrated because you won't let me. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, all right, let's talk about that. So, you know, I'm, I'm most proud that I get to see that in him mm-hmm. and I get to see him leaning into that like no my mom says I can talk to her about these things <laughs> right mm-hmm. right what a gift mm-hmm. and how do you see your first as playing a role inside of creating this self-advocating little human <laughs> I just remember I mean I I I don't ever want anyone to have the um to have that experience that I had, like waiting so long before figuring out that I was like smart, you know, or yeah. like, um, you know, like the, 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 there's like a phrase that like the first bullies in your life are usually your parents. Like mm. and I didn't want, my mom was my bully. And for a long time, even when she wasn't in space with me, or even when we weren't talking, we're, we actually still don't talk today. But like, even though, even when she wasn't in space with me, she, I could hear her voice harpooning at me. And that on some respects made me go farther. Like, no, I'm going to accomplish this. I'm going to get this done. But it was almost toxic, you know? Yeah. And, and on, on another respect, I didn't, I didn't want Hunter to experience that. I didn't want him to go through that. And I think yeah. being, being a first in the, in my family has helped me to realize more than anything, how much social emotional grounding is so important to the things, to the physical things that we're trying to accomplish. Like, and I just want him to have good, firm grounding, have the language, have the feelings like, yeah. you know, and then do what you need to do. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, he is so lucky to have you, Mama. Oh, I'm lucky to have him because he be. I know that's right. Setting me straight. <laughs> he be setting me straight. I'm like, are you kidding me, now? <laughs> I love that. Mm-hmm. I I'm, I have a girlfriend that I I'll be like, come get your nephews. <laughs> they, they always trying to check me and mm-hmm. mom. Did she tell you those are her pronouns? Right. <laughs> It, it, I'm like, okay, I'm sorry for misgendering. I did. She did not tell me those were her pronouns. I apologize. Mm-hmm. And my girlfriend goes, well, that's what you get yeah. for raising a liberated woke child. I said, I know, mm-hmm. I know. <laughs> and it's, it, you know, they cut a little different now. Like, you know, so you, it's just adjusting to him and adjusting the, adjusting to his intelligence. So like, that was something else that I had noticed. Like once I figured out like, oh, wait a minute, I'm kind of smart. I started looking back at my life and being like, oh wait, there were other areas in my life where I was also smart. 
Mm. So what I've noticed is like, now I'm hyper aware of like appreciating Hunter's intelligence, whatever Uh, that intelligence shows up. Got it. And so, you know, help like now he, you know, he just is a conversationalist when he, when he, when he warms up, because he don't like everything. But when he warms up, he's like a conversationalist. He will talk to you about world events. He will talk to you about Pokemon and all these things. Um, But he has like very deep insights about life at five. And I'm like, okay, like this is happening. Like less, you know, it's amazing. It's really amazing to watch. So Mm. don't get in a car or pick him up from school. I'm like, Hunter, my God. That's how I've been seeing it. He'd be like, Mom, <laughs> I need quiet time. Oh, damn. I need quiet time. And I'm like, all right, quiet time with music or quiet time without music. He'll be like, quiet time with, no, no, no. He just said, I need quiet time. So I said, all right, the music plays, we're driving. And then I like start singing the song. He's like, quiet time without music. Oh, damn. <laughs> and I'm dang. like, hey, you did not understand the assignment, Mom. <laughs> And he was like, I'm feeling very overwhelmed. I've okay. been doing a lot of talking today and I just need quiet time. So I'm like, all right. You know, but in the moment, Listen. it's not fun because you're like, first of all, first of all, this is my car. <laughs> and I'm going to play soca music anytime I want. And he's all just right. like, and I, again, I can't shut him down because I want mm-hmm. him to utilize the skill when I'm not in the room. So I'm like, Beautiful. All right. But I will, you know, I'm like, you're being a little spicy right now. I'm being spicy because I feel frustrated. Like, oh, snap. Listen. <laughs> what are you That's frustrated? amazing. Mm-hmm. I wish I had those skills, man. <laughs> Me too. I, I still find it hard to articulate that. I'm like, husband, <laughs> please walk away from me. <laughs> I need quiet. So I'm going to try that. I'm going to say, Hunter said, Right. Like the other day, he was like, <laughs> I want that. You know, Steve and I are separated. So he lives in a different state. His dad and I are separated. He lives in a different state. And he was like, I want dad to live here. And I was like, here in the house or here in the state of Delaware? And he was like, here in the house. And I was like, absolutely not. That's not going to happen. And he was like, well, you don't have to be so spicy about it. Oh, see, it was just a thought. <laughs> like well you have I mean it was like fine I will take I'll take Delaware so I was like all right um and I was like well why do you want him to live down here he's like well when you are feeling frustrated and upset I can just go hang out with him and then when I'm feeling frustrated and upset with you I can go hang out with him everybody wins it's like Go sit down somewhere. Like five like, years old. Five, five years old. old. I love Mom, it. I have an idea. And every time he says, I don't know, some bullshit is about come flying. It's <laughs> so well thought out. And like, right. It makes sense though. If you think about it. I was like, okay, well that's oh my gosh. So. That's beautiful though. It's such a testament to all the work that you you put in to have give him the ability to even. And the wherewithal to navigate solutions and questions and name his feelings. I mean, I don't know that I can name on two hands adults who mm. can communicate so effectively. <laughs> no, no offense to friends, y'all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but we be struggling. We struggle. So that's yeah. that's beautiful. Definitely something to be proud of. Um, mm. Last question. What would you say? to that 14, 15 year old Shauna at Randolph, getting there early to wash up, Mm -hmm. clean undergarments, maybe feeling all kinds of emotions Mm -hmm. and maybe frustrated, maybe ashamed and maybe sad. Uh, What would you tell her now if you could? Mm -hmm. Let me see, at that time I was like, maybe 16 or 17, but I would tell her that you do not have to spend 
any part of or the next few years of your life shrinking yourself mm. that you can fit in. If they don't like you and they don't like it, that's okay. They're entitled to their feelings, but you are still entitled to being yourself as long as you're not hurting people. Mm. You're not trying to rob people. You're not trying to scam people. Like you entitled to be you and you're entitled to explore that whether that comes with mistakes or not. Mm. I love that. Mm. Wise words, y'all from Shauna. You, <laughs> Alan, thank you so much for being here, friend. Thank you for having me. This was very lovely. I feel like, I mean, we have many times, but I feel like this conversation could go on for five more hours. <laughs> but I've already gone over what I said I was going to go over. Um, but I did want to thank you because I, I do take notes because uh, these sessions of, often are very healing for me. Mm. So I always tell my homies, like, even if nobody else listens, man, this is just cathartic, like to talk to folks, hear stories, share um, and really uh, learn, just learn as as I continue to grow. But um, what I'm taking away from today that I really loved about what you said today is um, I love when you said too much energy is wasted on being bothered. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't feel like I think enough about or at least in the past, I'm trying to be cognizant of it now enough about where I put my energy. Right. Mm -hmm. Like oftentimes we associate it with like projects and work and oh, did I do too much? But doing is one thing, but also what you're thinking about, what you're responding to, what you're reacting to is also a source of energy. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that you just named that out loud, that you were wasting so much time being bothered. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that you named that crying was super healthy mm -hmm. and then created a clearing for you. Because um, I feel like those things can go hand in hand, right? Like, just clearing out all that, all those triggers, all those emotions. So I, I really appreciated that. Um, I also really appreciated you distinguishing sort of the years of surviving mm -hmm. versus the years of like living now. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that's such a, such two different perspectives that sometimes we meld together because we're trying to do this and that. And, and like, yes, we, there are many circumstances um, that might necessitate like survival strategies and tactics and mm -hmm. we we got to live too. So I, I really, that resonated with me just hearing that reminder of like distinguishing those two things. Um, and I, 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 I mentioned this already, but I want to say it again. Um, I love the, the quote about mothers, um, but I love the, or not love, but I appreciate the notion of like always being cognizant of your pain so that you're not sort of bestowing it on children, on people, on folks around you. Um, and I think that's a hard process, mm -hmm. but I love the way you name the different ways to like ground yourself and identify and be surrounded by tribe and breathe through it. And even the tools that you're given Hunter, like, honestly, I'm taking away those tools for myself of like, naming what you need what exactly you're feeling and what exactly you need like that's the blueprint mm -hmm. that's it's the blueprint okay, know. sometimes you don't know so and it's okay right. to be, i don't know but right. I think sometimes we say i don't know and then we never come back to it later it's the follow-up that we have to up. really practice you know a follow-up that's so true because usually i don't know means moving right along mm -hmm. but investigate to figure that out. Um, I just appreciate you so much. And I think what you're doing for the world, for your son, for your clients is such a gift um, and such a contributor to all of our healing, honestly, because it is a, a trickle, not even trickle down, a butterfly effect, right, of healing. <laughs> so I, I appreciate that. And um, for, for our folks listening, if there's something that stayed with you or spoke to you or moved you uh, or a lingering question that you have for Shauna, uh, I, I request that you please share them with us on social media. 
Um, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter and on Facebook. And Shauna, if folks want to connect with you and maybe talk to you about your past or your work that you're doing, or maybe they they would like to have you come in and consult, um, what's the best way to reach you, contact you, or follow the work that you're doing? Yeah, so um, folks can reach out to me directly via email. Um, it's S-H-A-N-A, which is Shauna at arcandmoonlight.com. Um, we have an Instagram that mostly has like small reels right now, uh, but that's really about it. Um, and then if um, on the flip side, if it's like more a conversation around healing and spirituality and tarot and dream analysis, you know, that's different. That one, you can reach out to me directly too at um mystic and moonlight.com you can set up an appointment directly on the site uh for more chatting more spiritual chatting fantastic and i'll be sure to include that in the description when this gets published um yeah and if this episode resonated with you share it uh share with a friend so that we can reach folks like us like you who can relate to all these complexities and layers of, of being the first Mm -hmm. um again i want to thank our very special guest shauna <laughs> lou allen thank you for just like your vulnerability your generosity your authenticity it's like a nice balm on well, the soul thank you. thank you i mean listen i can talk but listening is also a skill and also takes a lot of energy so i just appreciate you you know sort of putting yourself out there to be able to listen to my stories and the stories of others um, and to help get that out there and help sort of reach out to folks in a way that is both meaningful and healing. And I don't think we talk enough about the way that we can participate in healing. Like some people don't know that they can participate in healing, but we can mm. um, even in our work. And I just am so appreciative of you and the woman you've grown into and the mother you've become and the friend you've become and just all that you're trying to do to make the world right. So we are, we are very lucky to have you. Thank you, my friend. I love you. I love you and too. I'll, I'll want to thank our listeners for also participating today. Mm -hmm. Shout and, out to uh, the listeners. Shout out. <laughs> and like I mentioned, man, my hope is that this podcast will just provide a safe and like supportive space for folks who can get to interrogate and navigate and vibe with it and challenge it and just, you know, work through the real impacts of breaking chains. Mm -hmm. Well, my name is Ceci. This is Shauna. And this hey. has been First in the Family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, friend. Bye. Love you. Love you too. Bye. Bye. Thank you again to Shauna for such a powerful conversation today. Uh, a big shout out to my producer, Copy, the first in his family to be a producer. Please tune in next week to see who is first. My name is Ceci, and this has been First in Family. Mm -hmm.